Hello everyone, you're watching Ujama, and I'm your host, Michael Dorsonville. And in today's episode, we're gonna get musical. To start things off, we're gonna drop some knowledge about music. Did you know that your heartbeat mimics the beat of the music you're listening to? And it also causes the brain to release dopamine, a chemical that allows us to experience pleasure. Now imagine a world without music. Things would be very quiet, wouldn't they? Based on the studies of musicians, music can increase the volume of the brain and based on the studies of Dr. T.C. Singh, an Indian botanist, musical sounds can cause plants to grow faster. Now let's talk about people who are in tune. You see what I did there? More specifically, let's talk about music pioneers, people who had an impact on music history and an impact in their communities through music. Today, we'll meet one of these remarkable people. Today, we're going to be meeting a man who is a Cornell University graduate, writer, musician, videographer, youth organizer, recipient of the Union Square Award, and not to mention, founder of the Lyric Lab, an arts and writing program in East Harlem. He is without a doubt a music pioneer of today. We would like him to welcome to the show, Ray Ramirez. Uh, thank you for having me. How are sure. you? Um, <laughs> doing it right. Um, thank you. Now, I know I don't look like it, but I'm only 16, year old, 16 yes. years old. Yes, sir. And, uh, I just want to learn from your experiences and understand, like, what you have to go through. So, um, tell me, who, who is Ray? Ray, wow. Well, um, I say um, I'm a Puerto Rican father. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if I have to first define myself by anything, um, I'm a son. Um, I was born and raised here in Harlem. Um, I went to school here um, in Harlem up to high school, and then um, I left to college, um, you know, and so I'm a child of Harlem. Mm -hmm. I'm, a, I'm a man of Harlem now, and, you know, I'm also an artist. You know. right. Okay. Uh, what high school did you go to? Uh, I went to Manhattan Center for Science and Mathematics um, over at 116th Street in FDR, okay. and, um, and I, I was part of, like, the third class or something like that um, back in the late 80s, early 90s, late 80s. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. What, what was life like growing up in New York? Um, New York, I guess um, New York was hard like growing up um, in terms of the amount of violence, yeah. in terms of um, the amount of drugs. Um, y you know, in, in the 80s, um, you know, crack was a real big like epidemic here in Harlem mm -hmm. or throughout um, the United States in many of the urban cities. Um, so just de dealing with that, you know, and de dealing with the violence from that, you know, it was around you, surrounded. So it was, you know, difficult, you know, um, but um, there was still love, though, in, in Harlem, though. And, and since um, when I was young, actually, I, I worked at a, a youth um, a um, action organization that deal with drug counseling for youth and families in the area. Mm -hmm. And so we dealt directly with um, the drug epidemic and and also working with youth. So, um, you know, there was definitely love and people who cared yeah. that I also saw. Was there, do you have a favorite type of genre or any yeah. artist? Yeah, I mean, to me, I'm a child of hip hop, you know, also child of Harlem, child of hip hop. Um, mm -hmm. And so I'm there from day one of hip hop. Um, mm -hmm. And I was there, you know, trying to do head spins in the mm -hmm. beginning. And, you know, so it's definitely always been a part of my, my life and my understanding um, of how to see the world, you, you know, and so definitely hip hop. Um, and as I got older, you know, it expanded mm -hmm. to jazz and salsa and uh, other music from the Caribbean. Um, but hip hop was at the foundation though mm -hmm. of like my music. Yeah. Um, so my personal question, have you ever, like, have you heard the, the new generational music? Yeah. Like, I know there's a lot of mixture of like, 
um, old sound incorporated with the new yes. sound. Yeah, yeah. How do you feel about that? Um, I, I like some of it. Like, like some, some of it I like. Um, you, you know, definitely there are a lot of like young um, MCs today who I think connect um, and, and use lyrics um, in a way to uplift and and use um, music as a soulful connection. And so, uh, you know, I think of um, people like J. Cole mm -hmm. or um, Joey Bad, mm -hmm. um, of artists like that who I could definitely still connect with um, in terms of how I love hip hop and mm -hmm. the way they're using it to um, tell a story, you know. Yeah. So, and, and you know, and there's other music, um, hip hop today that I don't like, you mm -hmm. know, and I think everyone has, you know, like yeah, everyone has an opinion about hip hop and so um, it's cool though, you know. Yeah. Cool. Um, do you have a favorite instrument that you like to play, or is there one yeah. you think you're best at? Um, I think I might be best at the congas, um, the drums. Um, I've been playing it on and off for like 20 some years. Um, and when we started the band, though, um, I was a lead MC, but also when I wasn't rhyming, I was um, on the drums. So in the beginning on the first album, um, you know, definitely drums like w was a part of it. But yeah, mm -hmm. so drums is something that, you know, my pops used to play when he was younger. So I probably got that somewhere like in my memory. Um, mm -hmm. And so I always connected to the drum. Okay. Um, yeah. So can you tell us like what the, the welfare, welfare poets are? Yeah. So um, the welfare poets um, was a band that um, I hope to start. Mm -hmm. while I was an undergraduate uh, at Cornell University um, in the early 90s. Mm -hmm. And me and this other brother, Hector Rivera, um, we were undergrad undergrads and we were learning, you know, a lot of history. Um, uh, you know, Cornell was an amazing school and it definitely had a history of um, student uprising and um, it has an Africana Studies department there that you know had amazing classes so we were learning all this history um and we needed to express ourselves mm -hmm. and um and so we started this band while uh, as as an undergrad mm -hmm. um <coughs> the interesting thing is that the way that it connects um to Cornell is this program um Ujama, mm -hmm. um was the name of the dorm that i stayed at while my, my first two years at Cornell Oh. Um, and, you know, def being in, in this dorm and being around um, majority students of color and learning about history and being involved in um, student activism definitely laid a foundation for the, the band. Mm -hmm. What was uh, some of the emotions you and the band was going through when you guys first released the, uh, your first project? Um, it was, you know, um, I guess we had an understanding and, a, you know, a realistic understanding that the music that we were presenting was not um, commercial music and it wasn't mainstream music and so it w it's not going to have a mainstream impact mm -hmm. um, but we definitely knew that like there were enough people around the country around the city um, around Harlem around the world um, that wanted to, to you know connect to a more soulful um, and also more um, social uplifting form of music and yeah. so we knew that you know it'll be a hard task to push um, the album but we also knew that you know there were sources and people and channels that mm -hmm. wanted to have access to it. Okay. Though, um, and we were definitely, as as a band, you know, we were definitely connected mm -hmm. um, to different organizations and different social movements. And so that made sort of like, you know, putting our music out there a bit easier. Okay. Yeah. Um, so besides music, like, what are, what are some things you like to do in your free time? Um, let's see. I like, um, I like to... I like listening to, to music. Mm -hmm. um, I, I definitely love um, playing playing basketball. Mm -hmm. um, you know, going to the gym. Something one on one. Yeah, one -on -one. nah, <laughs> that'll be something else though. Mm -hmm. I gotta stay outside. Um, mm -hmm. It's just kind of <laughs> outside for on you. But, um, <laughs> but but definitely, you know, playing basketball. Um, mm -hmm. I love taking pictures. Um, mm -hmm. You know, um, and that's something that has been growing over the past couple of years of photography, um, videography, and mm -hmm. so yeah. Okay. Before we finish this interview, we'll be taking a break and switching to our YouTube segment. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Ray, and welcome to YouTube. In today's segment, we are going to be covering music pioneers. How do you think the world would be without music? A music pioneer is a very important person that has made historical impact on music. We're here with... Kimberly. Okay, so Kimberly, who is your favorite music pioneer? Michael Jackson, definitely Michael, Michael Jackson. Jackson. Why would you? Why do you think he's your favorite pioneer? Um, not not only was he a great singer, he was a great dancer, and I actually met him in person years ago. So. Okay. 
I don't know, I just enjoyed his music and his dancing. And when I met him, he was really nice, he was really sweet, really down to earth. He bowed and said, pleased to have met you. And my mom and I were like, pleased to have met us, or pleased to have met you. <laughs> Who is your favorite music pioneer? Music pioneer, I said, like, you know, Tupac, Michael Jackson, David Bowie, you know, the, the people that impacted music, you know? Max Bigavelle. Woo, okay. So t tell me about him. Well, Max grew up in Harlem. He had great music, he had soul music. He had that music that, you know, that take that thing out of you, that pull that out of you. Excuse my language, viewers. So yeah, so that's what's going on, and I, I believe he's one of the pioneers, he's one of the engineers, he's one of the people that influenced this game and made it to what it is today. That was today's segment of View 2, and back to you, Mike. Welcome back, Ray. Um, so can you briefly describe what the Lyric Lab program is and what kind of work <coughs> is done there and why it was created? Yes, um, the Lyric Lab program is an arts program um, where um, we run creative writing and, and audio recording workshops um, in schools, mm -hmm. um, working with youth, um, also working in adults, um, also working um, with adults in um, senior centers and after school programs, community centers, mm -hmm. in prisons. Um, and the idea is to give people direct access to, you know, this technology of, of, of like audio recording um, in order for them to share their thoughts, their ideas, um, their emotions, you know. And so for me as an artist, you know, I thought it was always critical that any artist, you know, make sure that they take the time to document their work. Okay. And so when I created this organization, I wanted to be a part of that um, for other artists to, to help them document like their work. Mm -hmm. um, I've been doing this work for about 20 years for different organizations, o over 20 years. And last year, I, you know, I decided that, you know, it was time for me to start my own organization. And, you know, and I went through, you know, a lot um, mm -hmm. and had a lot of help um, to, you know, get all the paperwork done, the incorporation, the 501c3 and stuff like that. And, and now, you know, we're in a place of trying to build it and trying to expand. Okay. Know? Um, so, like, the, the business side of things, does that, like, how does that get to you? Because you mentioned, you said you just went through a lot of things. How? Yeah. You know? um, it's been hard. It's been a hard year. Um, you know, th of any business, you know, people say, talk about the first couple of years are the hardest um, times um, where a lot of, you know, new um, businesses fail. Mm -hmm. and, and for not-for-profit is even more harder, mm -hmm. I, I believe, because your overall motive is not profit, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so just being able to um, have the track record to build up, to get the funding, um, to get into schools and things like that, um, it, it takes time. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of organizations are dealing with their own issues with um, timing and budgets. And so we, we, we wait on a lot of things and stuff. Mm -hmm. But it's just having the patience and having, you know, just um, the, just the, the, the grit to, yeah. to, to, to push it out and continue to, you know, to see the goal at the end of the tunnel and the light and to continue to push towards that, you know. So that's where I'm at now, you know, yeah. um, trying to expand and, you know, trying to like raise funds and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. You can apply that to anything in life too, by the way. Just yeah, you know, no, for sure. Like, um, you know, that's definitely, you know, lessons I learned growing up mm -hmm. from my family of like, you know, no matter what your obstacle is, if you focus on the goal, you know, you just have to keep pushing towards yeah, it, you know. Consistent. And and mm -hmm. yes, stay consistent with it and good things will happen, you know, and and so I definitely believe that though. Okay. Yeah. Um, out of all the ways you can contribute to your community, why why through music and why in Harlem? Yeah, you know, um, well Harlem, born and raised, but it, you know, I, um, it's, it's beyond Harlem um, mm -hmm. where, you know, I've done workshops all, all throughout the city um, in for uh, like a women's prison in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. um, Staten Island, um, I mean, it's, it's anywhere, a anywhere that wants the workshop, like I will go, you know, as far as, you know, like out of state um, to, um, um, to like states like Philadelphia, wherever, Pennsylvania, like, you know, definitely go. But um, the idea is that, you know, 
like our people, our community, um, mm -hmm. people uh, of color, um, a lot of times we are referred to as, you know, voiceless. Yeah. And, and, and for me, I think that we do have voices and, and, and I wanted to be a part of just amplifying like that voice, you know. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, um, our, I guess our, our, our mission is to use art um, in a way to enhance um, self-expression for yeah. youth and adults so that they can become more critical about the world they live in and the role that they'll play in shaping the future. And I think that's important for, for anyone to become critical about you know, the world, their life, mm -hmm. um, tomorrow, today, their community. And, and art is a beautiful way to do that though. Um, so. I'm very excited. Um, I'm, I'm humbled by yeah. all, all the kids, all the students, all the adults, mm -hmm. the seniors that we are working with that are just amazing, amazing talents, undiscovered talents. And yeah. um, I'm witness to it, you know, so mm -hmm. it's a beautiful thing. All right. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned that you, you reach out to correctional facilities and things like that. Why, why would you choose to expand your program there? <laughs> yeah, um, you know, because um, for me, um, a lot of our people are locked up. Uh, yeah. A lot of my friends growing up ha have been locked up. Um, some of my family members, right? And so there's always like this disconnect between prison and that population and community. Mm -hmm. And um, especially after they come out too, you, you know? And, and so I just see it as a way of just trying to bridge like the gap. And you know, um, when I worked, um, I was doing about a three month workshop at um, MDC Brooklyn, um, mm -hmm. the Metropolitan Detention Center at the Women's um, um, Center. And some of the most amazing, amazing writers were, were, were there and took part in the class mm -hmm. and, and, and didn't have any history in writing poetry, but we were able to produce a, a book and anthology of their poems that's online and anyone yeah. can check it out at our website um, and read it. And you will see some of the most amazing poems. Um, you know, the premise of the class was that I would introduce topics and mm -hmm. I would introduce like different poetry formats and, and, and then we'll just write and we'll talk and we'll discuss. And what came out was so much beautiful work. Um, and I think that, you know, that is a testament to like, you know, that our people have a lot to offer and you know and n not a lot of people are looking for it you know yeah. um that reflects back to working with seniors for the first time recently and just recording them sing yeah. and that was the most mind-blowing thing though to see so much talent and you know and talent that's been there for such a long time you know and to see that come out again was it was amazing so i hope to continue to do this work you know for a long time our mission is to utilize the arts and support youth and adults to enhance their cultural expression and become more critical about the world they live in and the role they'll play in shaping the future. How did you realize the Lyric Lab was the way in which you wanted to impact your community? Um, for me, I think it was the effect that hip hop had on me and, and my life and, um, and lyrics and, and writing and poetry and mm -hmm. self-expression and uh, and I felt that I wanted to be a part of that process um mm -hmm. when I work in schools um with youth uh, that are into hip hop you know I want to have that conversation th that yeah. dialogue about who they listen to and why they listen to who they listen to and why I listen to who I listen to mm -hmm. and to have that conversation about what are you know these artists telling us you know and e even if they come to the conclusion that I'm not into the lyrics I'm into yeah. the music or just, you know, whatever, but at least to have that, you know, that like articulation um, mm -hmm. uh, of ideas going back and forth about this is writing and we could be critical of it. And, you know, and, uh, and I think that that goes a long way um, to having people open their ears to other artists, mm -hmm. um, you know, and it just helps you expand, you know, your thoughts, your ideas, the way you react to things, um, uh, you know, and, and it helps in life though. So I, I definitely feel that, you know, self-expression definitely goes a long way mm -hmm. in building community. And um, one of the taglines or one of the models of our organization is um, we are building community one song at a time, right? Yeah. And, and I feel that with everyone that records, no matter we're at a prison or we are uh, working with the homeless or we're working with seniors and then we come together and we have this big sort of like unity function um, it just feels so beautiful that you can have youth there with mm -hmm. seniors and, you, you know, um, and so I definitely feel that we are building community. Um, you know, art is a tool. Mm -hmm. Art is also a weapon yeah. um, for self-defense, for pushing yourself forward. And so I'm just want to arm, mm -hmm. arm our people in the most positive way. You mm -hmm. know? 
Um, after 15 years of existence, uh, what type of impact do you think your company has had on the community? Um, the welfare boards, um, th uh, the band uh, mm -hmm. um, itself, uh, um, we've, you know, performed all over the world and, um, and it's been, and we've been a part of many social movements here in New York and throughout the United States. Um, and so, although we never reached a sort of social success that other like big bands do reach, um, mm -hmm. I've been so fortunate to to travel and to see parts of the world that I've never would have ever been able to go to unless I paid for it directly or something. Mm -hmm. um, so, y you know, so that has been a beautiful thing. And the impact, you know, people contact us and contact me, you know, and like yo, your music, you know. Um, I still listen to it, and so that is always a humbling thing. Mm -hmm. um, just real quickly, one time we were in Germany, mm -hmm. and we were performing, and then the the crowd was like rhyming our songs mm -hmm. back to us. Mm -hmm. And it was our first time in Germany, and everyone's speaking like you know German, and mm -hmm. it, but it was just a, a unreal sort of surreal yeah. sort of um, experience. One so of those once in a lifetime moments, right? Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Time out. Is that a historical fact? You're about to be informed of one of the most influential music pioneers of the Harlem Renaissance. We'll now switch over to the end. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to, or welcome back to, Fact of the Day. I'm Vianne Robinson, and I'm here today to talk about one of the most influential music pioneers of our time. Ella Fitzgerald, the first lady of song, was not only a female jazz singer that Americans fell in love with for more than half a century, but a music pioneer in her own right winning 13 Grammy Awards and selling over 40 million record albums, as well as accompanying some of the greatest jazz musicians of all time, from Duke Ellington and Nat King Cole to Frank Sinatra and Benny Goodman. Her unique, flexible, and universally appealing sound remains ageless and had a remarkable ability to replicate any instrument in an orchestra. To understand the events that drove her from insecurity and shyness into warranted fame and success, we have to dive into the harrowing events that later came to define her life. Fitzgerald was born in Newport, Virginia on April 25, 1917 by Father William and Mother Temperance, or Tempe as she was better known, whom separated shortly after her birth. She took small jobs to help her family, even going as far as picking up and dropping money for local gamblers. Upon her mother's death due to serious injuries, Fitzgerald fell into a very dark and unhappy place. Reflecting upon the traumatic experience years later, she recalled that it helped her mature not only as a musician, but as a human being because she became more aware of what her success meant and how thankful she was for it. A quaint open mic night at the Apollo Theater proved to be the most important day of Fitzgerald's life. In a last minute change from original plans, she decided to sing for the crowd. Her gamble showed to be the first step in her illustrious career, as the audience was moved by her emotion and talent. Musician Benny Carter decided to take her under his wing in order to help her make a name for herself. She recorded her first record in 1936, but this was just the beginning, as she performed at Harlem's Savoy Ballroom, commonly referred to as the world's most famous ballroom, and took over as band leader when mentor Chick Webb passed away. However, Fitzgerald's career was not without its obstacles. As being an African-American singer who toured the United States, she felt the effects of discrimination. Notably, in Dallas, after she and her band were unnecessarily harassed by the police, they were arrested, sparking national backlash, even attracting the attention of Marilyn Monroe. Despite her faltering health, Fitzgerald continued to inspire her fans around the world simultaneously becoming an activist for child welfare. Ella Fitzgerald passed away on June 15, 1996, but cemented herself as a music pioneer for taking the traumatic experiences that defined her childhood and turning them into powerful and emotional songs. She refused to let harassment and discrimination stop her career and used her talent to bring joy to millions of fans worldwide from her humble starts to the present day and making the world a better and brighter place. Well, looks like time has run out. Thanks for tuning in to today's Fact of the Day. As always, history today isn't the history of tomorrow. Get out there and make your own history, and we'll see you next time. To me, um, I, I just right now, just thinking from the top, the top of my head, um, mm -hmm. when I was working with um, the organization Pitch the Homeless, um, I did like two residencies this past year um, mm -hmm. over about six months. And you know, I'm um, working, you know, with diverse populations, with yeah. um, such as people who are, uh, um, you know, trying to find home, trying mm -hmm. to find permanent housing, 
you know, um, just the ability to show up yeah. consistently, man, was was definitely um, inspiring to me. Um, regardless of what, you know, people were going through throughout the week, they knew mm -hmm. that I would be there on Thursday at five o'clock mm -hmm. and they showed up, you know, um, to share and, you know, and something that they were thinking about the whole week. So that, I mean, I, I guess it's a little different than, than what you was asking for, but to me mm -hmm. that was so inspiring and, and, um, and it stood out to me yeah. as like, wow, you know. Um, the other thing was um, working with three seniors, um, f a bunch of seniors, but three of them in particular who were singers and, and just how much they would love to perform. And we had some shows and how they just took over the shows. And, mm -hmm. and so that was definitely inspiring though. Yeah. Okay. Ray, we cannot thank you enough for joining our show and sharing your story and mission with us. I think you've all taught us a great way to make a change in our community through music. Appreciate it. Yes, sir. No yeah. doubt. Well, appreciate it. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in on today's episode of Ujama. Today, we learned that you can literally hear the ways music can be used to have an impact on communities as well as change history. Remember to follow us at the Youth Channel on YouTube and Instagram. For more updates and content, see you next time.